من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد Dear Muslims we are all painfully aware that as I speak right now Gaza the land where the great grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is buried the land where Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an walked through to demand and ask the keys of Jerusalem is now under the most vicious attack that it has been for the last two decades as we speak right now today Israel demanded from over 1.1 million people over half of whom are children under the age of 18 to evacuate from Gaza or else face complete annihilation a defenseless population with nowhere to go already cramped and crowded behind 50 foot walls is being asked to do the impossible flee to where go where you are the ones who have locked them up for over 25 years. You are the ones who have dehumanized them. You are the ones who have kicked them out of their lands 80 years ago. And their grandchildren and great grandchildren have never lived the lives of normal human beings. Go where? Flee where? Dear sisters and brothers, one of the most obvious biases that we must call out and acknowledge, one of the most obvious biases of all human beings, including us, is internal group favoritism we favor our own over others and at some level it is almost impossible to overcome this bias if my son is involved in fighting with another person almost always my heart will make some excuses for what my son does and overlook the injustices of my son and concentrate more on what the other person has does to cause my son to fight but this internal bias it might be excused if there is a fight that is somewhat equivalent, if there's a punch here and a punch there, if there's a curse here and a curse there. However, when one side is desperately using violence, when one side is completely and totally unjustified, then we cannot excuse ourselves by saying, oh, this is group bias. And what we are seeing right here, we must call this out for what it is. This conflict that we are seeing is not between two equivalent groups of people, not at all. On the one side, we have one of the most militarily powerful apartheid regimes, one of the last settler colonialist enterprises in the modern world. And on the other side, we have largely defenseless, two million civilians, uprooted refugees in their own homelands. There is no equality. There is no parity. We are literally witnessing in real live time on the media, from our politicians, from our president, all the way down, from so many celebrities, from so many voices of power, the blatant and continued dehumanization of the one side, the ignoring of the plight of one side, and that side is Palestinian and Muslim. The entire narrative is constantly framed as a specific condemnation of one group and the tactics of one group and the recent events that one group has done. Go listen to every interview. Go look at every press release. Go look at what our own president has said. It always hones in on the tactics of one group. We condemn this. Do you condemn that? Very well. That is a fair question to ask. But we have to ask in return, why is it that we have never once heard in over 80 plus years? Why is it that this deafening silence that we notice? Why is it that what is blatantly absent from every press release, from every interviewer, is the condemnation of war crimes against innocent Palestinian civilians? Where is the condemnation of the inhumane treatment, of the barbaric realities, of the blockages of the humanitarian efforts to over two million people? If you want me to condemn one tactic, are you willing to condemn 80 years of thousands of tactics? This reality 
brings into the sharp contrast the difference between the race, religion, and ethnicity of the victims. Not all human beings are treated as equal according to the eyes of the world that we live in. Not all blood is the same according to our own presidents and our own countries. No, the fact of the matter is that Palestinian blood, Muslim blood, Arab blood does not carry the same weight as that of other people. And hence, there is the blatant dehumanization of an entire category of humanity. Sisters and brothers, my khutbah today is a direct call for action from every single person, not just here, but around the globe who hears my speech. I'm not going to go over the history of the issue. I've done that and many have done that before. I'm not going to talk about the sanctity and blessings of Palestine very easily available. I will not list in detail the inhumane conditions of the people of Gaza for the last 80 years. That too, Google it away and click it away. Very simple. Rather, what I want today is to ask all of you without exception to become active and to do everything in your power with wisdom, with tact, to educate people around you about the reality of the situation. This is the very least that we can do. Every one of us, this is a call to action, to stand up, to learn yourself, and then to preach the truth to others. We must change the narrative. We must change the entire vision of what is happening in that land. And the only way that is going to happen is at the grassroots level, at the ground level, when you and I talk to our neighbors, our colleagues, our friends, when we get involved on social media, when we change one person at a time, when we eliminate ignorance from one person at a time. Today is a blatant call for action. Today is the day that every one of us is going to get involved and try our best in the long run to change what is happening over there. The fact of the matter, brothers and sisters, is that many of us, we don't even know ourselves what to say. We are cornered. Our colleagues come. Our bosses come. Our corporations come. Unbelievably, corporations and universities in this country are blatantly getting involved in politics. What business does a corporation have releasing a statement? Why should a university get involved and take sides in a political matter? Unbelievably, across this country and in Europe and many Western countries, personalities, media personalities, these Hollywood stars are getting involved in a political crisis, spreading misinformation. And anytime one of us stands up to educate, we are challenged. Do you condemn X, Y, Z? What is your stance on whatever they might follow with that? And I have to stand here bluntly and say, we don't have to support a particular political party of Palestine. We don't have to defend a particular tactic when we want to defend the human rights of two million people of Gaza. This is what is called a red herring. This is what is called trying to change the subject. I am not here to talk about the tactics of one group. I'm not here to justify or not one specific action. I am here to talk about the plight of two million people who have been deprived of basic humanity for 80 plus years. What about them? Fine, you want us to condemn? We will condemn whatever you want with the condition you be just and fair and you condemn with the same anger you want us to condemn you condemn what is happening for 80 plus years brothers and sisters next time you are asked do you condemn this or do you agree with this take a step back learn from the Quran and Sunnah learn from the Quran and even from the Old Testament these are the tried and tested tactics of people before do you know one story in the Quran that this reminds me of Fir'aun the Pharaoh the Old Testament tells us the Quran tells us the Pharaoh persecuted thousands of people. He killed tens of thousands of babies. He subjugated an entire civilization. The irony, the children of those civilization are now subjugating others. He subjugated the children of Israel and Prophet Musa was sent to them. Prophet Musa came to them. Moses, a figure we admire and the people of Israel admire. Moses went to Fir'aun. And in the process, you're all aware, Moses got involved with the fight with an Egyptian. He punched him. The Egyptian was accidentally killed. Fir'aun, the Pharaoh, after killing tens of thousands of people, after massacring thousands of babies, the Pharaoh accuses Moses of being the terrorist. 
And the Pharaoh says, you killed an innocent man. Fir'aun accused Musa of being kafir. Can you get more ironic than that? The Pharaoh says to Musa, you are the kafir, meaning you are ungrateful. The Quran teaches us, if truth is truth, we speak it. What did Musa say? I did it, you're right. I accidentally killed somebody. I made a mistake. But then he challenged the Pharaoh and he went back to the Pharaoh and he said, what right do you have to mention this one mistake of mine in light of all that you have done? You have subjugated the children of Israel. You have decimated and massacred them. By what right do you mention one small mistake and one small perk you gave to me in light of your own history? This is what the Quran teaches us. We flip the narrative. We change the script. Even if some of you feel we need to condemn a tactic that is on you. Me personally, I will not apologize and I will not have anything to say about what subjugated people do but if somebody feels that they need to do that as long as you move on to the bigger picture and you say okay how about what is happening there for 80 years the seerah teaches us a similar incident when the Muslims were expelled from Mecca when the Quraysh killed and persecuted dozens of Sahaba when Ammar saw his own parents Yasser and Sumayya literally shred into bits when Bilal is dragged through the streets when the Prophet is attacked and attempted to be assassinated and the Muslims flee for their own lives in one skirmish, in one skirmish, some of the Muslims were engaging the Quraysh in the sacred territory of Al-Haram and during the sacred months and they killed one Qurayshi. The Quraysh immediately began spreading news. Oh, look at these terrorists. They are killing a Qurayshi on sacred grounds inside the Haram area in the sacred months, the Ashhur al Hurum. These are the real terrorists. They are disobeying the law of Allah. They are disobeying every law known to us. And so this became problematic for the Muslims. What is to we do now? I mean, technically, technically, this Qurayshi was killed in the sacred Haram and it, he was killed in the sacred months. So the Muslims were perplexed. Allah revealed in the Quran, listen to this. They ask you about fighting in the sacred months. They ask you about what happens when somebody is killed in the sacred months. And Allah says, and this is what we should say, Killing anybody on sacred land and in sacred times, it is kabir, it is a sin. It is something that should not be done. Allah did not justify this. Allah did not sanction this. This is not something that theoretically is good to do. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the Quraysh and Allah says to them, but you preventing people from coming to the Masjid al-Haram, expelling innocent people, massacring them, spreading your fitna and fasad. It is much bigger and a far greater crime than one person having died. And your chaos in the land is far worse than the killing of one person that you are angry about. This is what we call Islamic justice. Muslims, we do not need to defend tactics. Muslims, we do not need to defend that which the general rule of humanity and a people of faith says should not be done. Because we know the general rule of all societies, of all people of faith, of international law, and yes, of our sharia, is that innocent people should not be killed. Innocent women, innocent children who do not pose any threat should be spared. And we preach this publicly and we say it unabashedly. But we also also point out we also point out not to justify not to condone but to educate to contextualize to illustrate the reality of war again not to validate but to educate that the targeting of innocence during times of war during times of conflict this is a brutal reality that happens across the globe and the very people the very organizations the very countries that are pointing fingers are themselves guilty of far greater crimes in this exact same genre. Once again, I have to be super careful. Every word I say will be taken by Fox News and by memory and others and misquoted. So I must be careful. This is not a justification. This is a contextualization. This is an education. So we understand war is brutal. And sometimes things happen in war that nobody wants to happen. Our own country 
country of America, which of course claims to follow international law and usually says we should not kill innocent civilians. United Kingdom that is also signed on to these international treaties during World War II. During World War II, they had to intentionally begin bombing civilian populations. When the tide of war was changing, when Germany was being given the upper hand, both England and America began the intentional, direct, targeted killing of mass civilian populations in Germany. The cities of Cologne, of Hamburg, of Dresden were entirely decimated. Tens of thousands of innocent children and women were intentionally targeted by the Allied forces. If you were to ask them, why are you doing it? They would say, well, they're doing it to us. We have to fight back. They're the ones bombing London. We have to bomb Dresden. They're the ones bombing England. We have to go and bomb Cologne and other places. Wars, sometimes re re the retaliation occurs that is beyond the laws of the land and again let us not forget sisters and brothers the awkward reality it is an awkward reality no justification but facts are facts that when the war was shifting when Germany was seeming to have the upper hand our country America spent the equivalent of over 30 billion dollars on the Manhattan Project and do you know what the Manhattan Project was the Manhattan Project was an intentional research and survey to create the deadliest bomb hitherto unknown to mankind. They wanted to create the atomic weapon and the purpose of that weapon was what? It wasn't to bomb the, the, the forces of the Germans. It wasn't to annihilate the soldiers. It was intended to create the largest group of mass civilian casualties that the world had ever seen. Groups of scientists, groups of engineers, groups of physicists, they came together in secret locations for years on end. Billions of dollars were spent and the explicit purpose, no peace, no cancer research, no nothing. We want to create the most effective bomb to kill whom? Civilians. And what happened? How did World War II come to an end? We all know this reality. Our country, with our tax-paying dollars, used the largest and the most effective and destructive weapons known to mankind, the atomic bomb, and intentionally targeted not the forces of the Germans, not the forces of the Japanese, they intentionally targeted two civilian cities. Nagasaki and Hiroshima and over a quarter of a million women and children innocent civilians were intentionally targeted the president as an advisor sat in front of a map and they debated the pros and cons of which city should be killed which American went to jail for that which American ever was court-martialed which country ever had to apologize for that again this is not a justification it is a contextualization those who point fingers those who say why are you killing innocent civilians we say back to them how come you did much worse during your own wars if you thought you were justified because one of your naval bases was attacked Pearl Harbor if you thought you were justified in killing a quarter of a million people I want that number to sink in 250,000 innocent people and you know the worst part they intentionally chose mid-sized cities they didn't want too large they didn't want too small to send the right message what we can do the evil nature of of wanting to kill 200 and the entire city's wiped out excuse me you have no right to point fingers at another group that might be doing things unethical I'm not justifying again for the record I'm not justifying but I'm sorry you have no right to point your fingers at a group that is doing much less than what you yourself have done in response to much worse that was ever done unto you history sisters and brothers makes you powerful history educates you and if you know your facts and you know your realities no one can defeat you in a debate the purpose once again is not to justify but merely remind us that those people who are most eager to point fingers are usually the most guilty of having done the same crimes as for me I have no qualms stating loudly and clearly that the Quran teaches us the Sunnah teaches us the Seerah teaches us that the default is that during times of war we're supposed to protect the lives of the innocent but I merely educate I merely push back and say how come you are selective in applying these rules throwing them in our faces which we acknowledge these are legitimate rules when you yourselves don't seem to care about the lives of two million innocent civilians where is your own supposed care where is your own alleged concern for the women and children when they belong to another ethnicity and another religious group Muslims always remember 
always remember this reality in this land you don't need to be a Muslim to sympathize with one side as I said if the war was somewhat similar we could understand the bias of each side but there is no similarity the fact of the matter is every neutral person who examines the reality of the situation will come to the same conclusion. Always quote neutral experts and make sure you know these quotes. One of the greatest icons of our century, somebody whom the globe admires is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in isolation, 27 years because he refused to sign a paper that said, because of the color of my skin are not equal to you. 27 years he was in isolation. I visited his cell. It is smaller than this small little box that I'm in. I visited his cell and I stood there. He had a small window for 27 years. That was his outer reality to the world. He refused as a man of conscience to say, I am lesser of a human being. And when he was in jail, this country of ours and the United Kingdom and Canada and Australia all consider him a terrorist. You should know this. Our country considered Nelson Mandela to be a terrorist only when he was released and the tide of public tide was changed. Was he welcomed as a freedom fighter? Was he welcomed as a, somebody who deserves the Nobel Peace Prize and so on and so forth? Nelson Mandela was a ardent supporter of the Palestinian cause. Multiple times he would speak out and in support of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And he said, and I quote, that the treatment of the Palestinians is the worst moral crises of our times. He said this after being in jail 27 years, after fighting the apartheid South African regime. He said the Palestinian plight is the worst moral crisis of our, our, of our own times. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the second most prevalent African freedom fighter. Desmond Tutu is the highest ranking member of the Catholic Church. He's passed away now widely celebrated, widely known to be a freedom fighter, also having been in jail, also fought apartheid. Archbishop Desmond Tutu visited Palestine multiple times. In a famous interview in the 80s with the most famous journal, journalist alive at the time, David Frost, you can find it on YouTube. David Frost wanted to complain to Desmond Tutu, how come you can describe Israel as an apartheid state? That's not fair. You shouldn't describe Israel as an apartheid state. It's not that bad. Desmond Tutu, responded back to him that actually, listen to this, this is on YouTube, actually in some aspects Palestinians are treated worse than us black South Africans were. In some aspects, it is worse than an apartheid state that I have lived through. This is from Desmond Tutu. Are you going to accuse him of being anti-Semite? Are you going to accuse him of being pro-Palestinian because he's Muslim? He's a archbishop of the Catholic Church. He's not a Muslim, but he has lived through apartheid. He's seen the realities of hate, and now he's experienced it firsthand. The grandson of Nelson Mandela also visited Palestine, and he wrote an op-ed which is published in an Israeli newspaper the Haaretz and he wrote an op-ed and he said that what I have seen here is worse than the apartheid that I have experienced growing up this is the grandson of Nelson Mandela it is worse than the apartheid I've experienced growing up sisters and brothers you don't need to be a Muslim to recognize the inhumanity of the situation know your people know your quotes our own president Jimmy Carter he visited those lands and after he left office he's still alive now after he left office he wrote a book. Do you know what the title of the book is? Peace, not apartheid. Peace, not apartheid. That is the title of the book. Our president, are you going to accuse him? He's actually a Christian believer. He's actually a supporter of the faith of Christianity. He's a known person who loves his, his faith and tradition. He's not a Muslim. And yet when he visited, he said, we cannot move forward with this apartheid regime. And he himself acknowledged that Gaza, Gaza is the largest open air prison in the world today. The largest open air prison in the world today. And I can quote you on and on human rights, Amnesty International, on and on. But you know what the problem is, sisters and brothers, the awkward reality? Do you know what the root of the problem is? It's not religion. Frankly, it's not even fully political. The brutal and raw fact of the matter is that so many people on our side of the world, in spite of our education, in spite of our achievements, in spite of we're living in such an enlightened era, so many people are still completely and totally 
wed to the notion of the superiority of their own race over that of other people. The root of the problem, frankly, is a racist outlook on the Palestinians and the Arabs and the Muslims. The root of the problem is the superiority complex that they don't view Palestinian blood and Arab blood and Muslim blood to be equal to their own. And therefore, when they see all that is happening, when they see all of the tactics, their hearts do not stir. There is no emotion because they view themselves and their race and their faith as being more human than that of others. And this is what we see around us. When we listen to interviews, when we see the tweets, when we see the endorsements from politicians, subhanAllah, sisters and brothers, you know, when we criticize Israeli policy, when we criticize aspects of what is happening there, we are accused of anti-Semitism. We are accused, oh, you guys are anti-Semitic. I will acknowledge, rarely, this criticism is true. I will acknowledge sometimes some clerics and some people use a language that is not appropriate and they talk about Jewish people all together and I say no our problem is not with Jewish people it is not with Christian people our problem is with Zionism in our lands of Islam Jews and Christians lived peacefully they lived as neighbors as full citizens of an equal opportunity with everybody our problem is not with people of another faith our problem is with policies so I admit once in a while you'll find a cleric you'll find somebody who uses language that is not correct and there is an element of anti-semitism however let us flip the script let us flip the script you say we are anti-semitic when we point out problems with Israel let me flip the script how about your Islamophobia when you caricaturize and paint all Palestinians in a particular right? How about your hatred of Islam when you describe everybody in that region with derogatory terms? Our own president, some of the most powerful people in Congress, some of the most influential politicians, the language they use is the language of genocide. It is the language of dehumanization. Israel's minister called all Palestinians beasts and animals. That is not the language of humanity. That is the language of genocide. You are calling for all out genocide when you say an entire population is subhuman. If you look at the language that is used, they don't deserve to live. We will annihilate all of them. Again, this isn't the few people that did what you consider a crime. If that was your call, I at least see where you're coming from. But when you extrapolate from 5, 10, 20, 50 people and you say all 2 million people don't deserve to live they are not fully equal when you bring into their fact their faith when you bring in their religion and you say they should be given hell as the pseudo intellectual Jordan Peterson said he literally tweeted to Netanyahu give them hell them is who all Palestinians we see the reality of their hatred it's not about truth and justice it is frankly about a superiority complex they literally believe they are better than everybody else and therefore the life of a Palestinian the life of an Arab, the life of a Muslim in their eyes is not the same as their own lives. But sisters and brothers, I want to conclude the first khutbah with a little window of hope. A little window of hope. I say, as somebody who is an amateur in history, I love studying history, I say, the tide is slowly changing. Slowly, but inevitably, the tide is changing. For three reasons. Firstly, social media and the proliferation of videos and cell phones and the immediate access that everybody can have to the truth. The fact that somebody can take a video of what is happening in Gaza and post it to YouTube, to Twitter and immediately make it accessible. This is a game changer. Make no mistake about it. In the 70s, in the 80s, we couldn't do this. It was a very skewed narrative. Now, it is impossible to be blind to the injustices of Gaza if you have a heart. Now it is impossible for anybody with a shred of humanity and an ounce of justice to think that this is a fair game between two equals. Not at all. Images and videos and interviews are available and we must use them, retweet them, educate and make sure the tide begins to change. So point number one, social media. And by the way, this is despite the problems that we're getting. Today, our Facebook, we had a generic post about we're going to be doing a khutbah about Palestine. Facebook complained. Somebody complained to Facebook and our post was taken down. Why? 
Were we calling for what? Because it said, Yasir Qadi giving a khutbah on Palestine. Our post was taken down by Facebook because we're simply wanting to educate. But they cannot take down every post. They cannot silence every voice. That's why I'm making a call to every one of you. Stand up with wisdom. Stand up with tact and preach the truth and educate. They cannot silence millions of voices, millions of images, millions of videos. That's what we need to do. Point number one. Point number two, despite the fact that almost all Western governments, even universities, corporations, companies, Hollywood, pseudo-intellectuals, are pretty much many of them are supporting one side and completely against the Palestinian cause. Despite the fact that France, which has challenged freedom, it wants people to desecrate the Quran, it wants people to make fun of the Prophet France has banned protests when it comes to Palestine. Germany has banned protests when it comes to Palestine. England is thinking of criminalizing holding a Palestinian flag. Look at the irony of free speech. Where is the free speech when our Prophet is being insulted? You told us to shut up and sit down and let us do what we want to do. When we're clamoring for human rights, all of a sudden it is illegal in England, in, in, in France. It is illegal in Germany. France is, uh, England is talking about it and even in our own home countries things are going back and forth however with all of that I still say that never have we had so many public people and intellectuals and leaders and organizations speak on behalf of the truth so yes compared to the 70s and 80s we actually have a lot more people a lot of fair journalists a lot of organizations preaching the truth you cannot cover up the truth forever and this harsh media assault by our politicians, by these right-wing organizations, frankly, it is a sign of desperation. They know they have to be super harsh, but they cannot silence millions of voices. So point number two, we actually do have people supporting us. And point number three, and one of the main points I want to make here, sisters and brothers, it's no longer the 1960s and 70s. The world has changed radically. And one of the things that it has changed in is demographics. We, as American Muslims, are no longer a very small minority. We're still a minority, but you cannot compare to how we were 40, 50 years ago. Within a decade, we American Muslims will be the second largest religion in this country. Right now we're the third, uh, Christianity, Judaism, then Islam. Within a decade, Muslims are gonna be more than any other faith except Christianity. In Canada, in Australia, and in England, Muslims are already the second largest demographics after Christianity. In France, Muslims are definitely the second largest demographics. How then and why should any other group take charge of the narrative when the demographics is changing? Where is our voice? Where is our contribution to the public discourse? Where is our influence on our own societies and cultures? The fact of the matter, and I say this bluntly, I am a person who has said and has got me into trouble. I don't believe politics is the primary way to change ourselves. That's what I say, I could be wrong. Even if it's not the primary way, it is the secondary way. The primary way, Iman. The primary way, internally. That's what I believe. I could be wrong. My personal interpretation, number one mechanism, ourselves. But number two, without a doubt, tie your camel and then trust in Allah. We have to tie our camel. We have to be involved in the media, involved in politics, involved in influencing others. And now, Muslims in all of these lands, we do have a potent force if only we came together and we actually mobilize. The sad reality, many of us live disconnected lives from our culture and lands. Many of us are apolitical. Many of us don't want to get involved, but that's not how change occurs. Why is one narrative more than the other? Because one group of people influenced it. This is not sinister. This is not cabal Illuminati theories. This is politics. When you get involved and you campaign and you lobby and you raise funds and you influence this is what happens where is our voice almost absent that needs to change and I say this as somebody who bluntly believes politics is not the primary mechanism but is the secondary one so sisters and brothers one of the wisdoms of trials and tribulations is people of truth people of courage people of integrity they come to the forefront during trials we separate the munafiq 
from the true person. We separate the coward from the brave person. We are currently witnessing such a trial. Our masjid has been threatened today for this khutbah. You guys don't know about this, I'm telling you. It has been threatened today. Not violence, but attack, no, but um, uh, uh, protests and very evil things I don't want to mention here. I have been threatened. Others are being threatened. We don't have the luxury to remain silent. They are scared. They're scared because our numbers are increasing. Because the truth is on our side. Because they cannot cover up the truth if every one of us stands up and speaks the truth. So during these times of evil, during these times of chaos, I encourage every one of you to be brave, to educate, to put your trust in Allah and to be a beacon of hope and a beacon of truth during these dark times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me and you with and through the Quran and may He make us of those who its verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan. Ask Allah's forgiveness. You as well ask Him for His the ghafoor and the rahman. Alhamdulillah, al wahid al ahad, al samad, al lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakullahu kufuan ahad, wa ba'du. I reiterate my main point, sisters and brothers. I reiterate my point, not just to us sitting here, but to every person who sees this khutbah and sermon around the world. This is a call of action. We cannot help our brothers and sisters physically over there. We cannot do so for many reasons. In fact, what is even more painful, we cannot even raise funds that will reach them. Right now, I'm sorry to be blunt with you, Nobody can raise funds and actually, you can raise funds, it won't reach them right now. Right now, I just spoke with my own organizations and agencies, there is a blockade. There is an international blockade. You cannot give baby powder to babies. You cannot give medicine to children. You want to talk about inhumanity? This is the inhumanity. Raise as much funds as you want. Right now, it will not reach them. Don't be discouraged to raise funds. Raise funds. When the blockade is lifted, that will come immediately. But understand what I'm saying. As we speak, no food parcel can be delivered to Gaza. No aid can go to Gaza. Nothing can go there. So what can we do, sisters and brothers? There are two wars going on right now. There's a war of bodies over there. And that's something we cannot do except make dua to Allah. But there's another war, a war of the minds, a war of the media, a war of perception, a war of influence. And I say bluntly and boldly, we have to be involved in this other war. Now I know Fox is going to take this clip. Memory, which is the Joseph Goebbels of our times, will take this 10 second clip and twist it and say, I'm calling for war. So that I say clearly and unequivocally, the war that I'm calling for is not a Sharia based influence. This is not radical jihad. What I'm calling for is for us to stand up and be quintessentially American, be a part of the democratic process, be a part of campaigning, be a part of media influencing, be a part of public perception. This is the war that I'm calling for. I'm not calling for any violence. I'm calling for us to understand there's a reason why some interests are being served and others are not. And we cannot be silent. This is our country in the end of the day. And enough is enough with the lies and the propaganda and the smear campaigns for decades against innocent people. We of this land have the exact same rights and the exact same privileges as all other people. And if we unite together, not only as Muslims, but as all people of all different backgrounds, and we say to our leaders in Canada, in Australia, in England, and yes, in America, enough is enough. If we stand together and we make sure that our own tax dollars don't, are not sent overseas when our own country lags behind. If we educate our fellow American citizens, we have given a quarter of a trillion dollars. Do you know how much that is? It is simply astronomical. A quarter of a trillion dollars in military aid and in monetary aid to one small country that is perpetually at war with its own civilian population. Enough is enough. Muslims, people of all faiths, why should my tax dollars go overseas? Forget who's right and wrong. I have a right and you have a right to petition, to demand, to elect people who serve our interests. I have a right that my money is spent not to build prison walls over there, but to build schools over here. Not to send bombs to kill over there, but to build better hospitals to cure over here. Why should I spend 
billions of my tax dollars over there when our country is lagging behind in education, in healthcare. Spread the word, spread the campaign, and slowly but surely we can bring about a mass sympathy to simple realities. Our tax dollars are more deserving to be spent here than, get, than getting involved in a global conflict over there. Sisters and brothers, we do have enough people, especially in other Western lands. In America, we're still a little bit behind, but in Canada and England and Australia, the Muslims have enough quantity to really influence. In France, they most definitely do, but unfortunately, things are as they are. Here in America as well, there is a global movement beginning to un that understands why should we spend billions every year, billions overseas, when there's so much to be spent over here. So yes, this is a call to action and a call to war, not physical war, a war of the mind, a war of the tongue, a war of the intellect. And every one of us needs to be a foot soldier. Every one of us, because this is a long-term battle. It might take decades. We might not see victory today, but if every single one of us begins influencing the people around us, inshallah, a change can be made. And we need allies. This isn't a Muslim cause. This isn't an Arab cause. This is a human cause. It is true to state, even if you take religion out, even if you take ethnicity out, this is a human cause. So we appeal to all people, people of no faith. We appeal to Christians. See how Christians are being treated in that land. We appeal to members of the Jewish faith who have conscience, who believe in the God of Abraham who know from history what persecution means, and especially to our Jewish brethren and sisters who understand this reality. I have visit, visited Auschwitz and Dachau. I have visited the death camps. I have heard directly from Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. I have seen a person take his hand and show me the tattoo that the Nazis have done. There's a picture of that in the New York Times. And I see what hate can do. But I say loudly and clearly to my Jewish brethren, you cannot invoke the memory of a holocaust to inflict another potential holocaust on innocent victims and it is heartening to see so many in the jewish faith understand this there's an organization called jewish voice for peace which is which is asking for human rights for palestinians there are many ultra orthodox rabbis who are opposed to the political program of zionism we muslims need to ally with them take take lessons from them and join hands with christians jews people of no faith to clamor for a human rights issue issue in this area. Muslims, the path ahead might be long and treacherous. The path ahead might be full of some setbacks. Today, as we speak, Allahu A'lam what's going to happen to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. But the long-term war is not judged by one battle. We might lose a few battles. May Allah protect and may Allah forgive and may Allah bless. We might lose battle today, but the war in the long term is going to be won. The war of minds, the war of truth, the war of justice. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in the Quran that the truth shall always prevail over falsehood. The truth has come and batil has been vanquished and the truth shall always destroy falsehood. Put our trust in Allah. Look forward in the long run. Realize long-term victory might have some setbacks, but if every one of us gets involved, if every one of us does our part, if every one of us gets involved in the war of the minds and the war of the intellect and the war of the media, insha'Allah ta'ala, insha'Allah, in our own lifetimes, we will see the change of tide having completely gone. And that is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah's promise is never going to be vanquished. Sisters and brothers in the salah today, we're gonna to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the second rak'ah and make du'a. Dua qunut for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Allahumma inni da'in fa aminu. Allahumma la da'in fi hadhi yawmi dhamman illa ghafarta. Wala hamman illa farajta. Wala daynan illa qadayta. Wala maridan illa shafayta. Wala asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma filna wa li ikhwanin alayhi sabakuna bil iman. Wala taj'al fi qulubina ghillan lilladhin amanu. Rabbana inna karaufur rahim. Allahumma sul ikhwanan al musada'afina fi Palestine ya Allah. Allahumma sul ikhwanan fi Gaza ya Allah. Allahumma sul ma'ala aduwika aduhim. يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتاع ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم أذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة